Hello again guys, we are here for 4.4 applications of linear systems, and do not worry, it is not as bad as 4.3, not as long at least. Uh, I think this is way cool because this is when you start to get to apply the math uh, for some great learning, um, for some great opportunities, especially when we're talking about making money. So let's dive right in. Um, make sure you understand this. I'm not going to read it to you because that's kind of redundant. I'll pause this for a second, make sure you understand that. And then pause here so you can check out the graph. All right, so I know you saw on that graph right there that in every situation, every profitable, hopefully profitable situation, there's a break even point. So if we see this um, puzzle expert wrote a new Sudoku book and his costs for writing this entire book, everything were $864. Then his building and packaging for each book costs 80 cents. The price that he's going to charge for the book is $2. So how many copies must he sell in order to break even? Go ahead, try to set up what you think would be a way that we can solve that using our equations. All right, so we want the cost to equal the profit. So my cost is composed of a few different things. It's composed of my one-time fee of $864 that it costs to build everything, and then every book that I decide to uh, go ahead and package up is 80 cents. So I'll make that times B. And then my profit on every book or the money I bring in will be $2 for every book. And that's not actually profit. I shouldn't use the word profit. I should use revenue or income. Actually income is probably the better word. Now we could solve this another way if we look at uh, $2 is not the actual profit from the books. So we could just subtract the 80 cents and find the profit. So let's go ahead and set that up. If I subtract this 80 cents from both sides, the money I actually make from each book, that eight got goofed up. The money that we make from each book is actually $1.20. So at what point will I break even and make as much as I have spent? Go ahead and try this problem here about the break-even point of a bicycle shop. So pause the video, set this up on your own, and try it. All right, so what we know is that we want our outgoing funds to equal our incoming funds. So our outgoing is the 2400 per month. That's probably rent and utilities and everything else that you pay, uh, you know, your employees, all that. And then $60 a bike because you have to buy bikes in order to be able to sell them. Then your income is the $120 that you sell the bikes for each month. Now, of course, we've simplified all these numbers for our sake. So to get our terms together on one side, we can subtract the $60 from each side, which actually shows me that the profit I'm making from each bike is $60. And that is now equal to 2,400. That's the amount that I need. Um, so let's see how many bikes I need to sell to make that much. So we then see that we need to sell 40 bikes each month just to break even on our investment, our ownership of the store. So this sort of situation is really, really useful when you're looking at going into business and deciding how much business do I actually need to do to be able to stay afloat and make money and pay all my bills. So in this box right here, it's essentially saying we cannot go backwards in time. So that is what we call a constraint or what makes things viable in a situation. All right, guys, so now we have a situation about the zoo, which hopefully you've been to the Columbus Zoo lately because it is pretty awesome. So we have one tank that the water in that tank we can describe as being 10 gallons, but it is leaking, oh no, which that would be losing water at two gallons per hour. So our variable there is gonna be hour. And then the water in the second tank is six gallons and it's leaking at a constant rate of four gallons per hour. So uh, let's go ahead and try to decide when will these two tanks have the same amount of water? Well, we need to set them equal to each other to know when they'll have the same amount of water. So go ahead, set them equal and try to solve for our variable H. All right, so when I set the equations equal, then I decide to add two H to both sides of course, that doesn't have to be your first step, but that's just what I did. Then I work the problems from there, and I now get to this point where negative 2h is equal to 4. So I divide by negative 2 on each side, and I see that h, the amount of time that it would take for the tanks to be equal, 
is negative two hours. Now that should obviously ring a little bell in your head that says negative two hours doesn't make any sense at all. So if we went backwards in time, if instead of the tanks leaking, they were gaining water, then at some point they were equal, but if, considering that the tanks would then overflow, that would not be possible. So you cannot go backwards in time. Sometimes negative numbers just don't make sense. Try uh, the no, problem number three here, talking about investment. Pause the video and give this a shot. So again, there's multiple ways that we can solve any math problem. Uh, but on this one, I've decided to set up that I know that A and B are the principal that we started with. The principal being the amount that we begin with in an account. And uh, I know that account A will earn me 5% interest, which I can represent by earning interest by 1.05. And account B will be 4%. So A is going to be the amount I put in account A. B is going to be the amount I put in account B. And that will have the principal plus the interest earned. So uh, then when I replace what I know, A plus B will equal 1,500, and my 1.05A plus 1.04B will equal the principal plus the interest amount here. So go ahead and isolate either your variable A or B, and then plug it in to this problem down here to solve for one of the variables. Pause the video and give this a shot. All right, I think this might get messy for a minute, but hang on to your seats. So we subtract B from both sides and we find out that A is equal to 1500 minus B. I substitute that in for A over here and I do the multiplication finding out that 1.05 times 1500 is actually 1575 and that then will be minus 1.05B. But then that gets added by 1.04B or 1 in 4 hundredths. And that's still all equal to my 1569 and a half. And I will fix that typo. All right, so definitely want you paying attention for this because it does get a bit messy, but I promise this is going to work out. Because I have a negative variable value and because my constants, if I took it away from this side, would then just give me a negative opposite another negative, I can do a little switcheroo here. So I get rid of this constant on this side by subtracting on both sides. And I add this variable to both sides to get a positive variable and a positive constant value. So try that. So I add the variable value on both sides. I subtract the constant value on both sides. And I could do this in two separate steps, or I can combine it in one as long as I'm careful. So then my left side, I get 5.5. My right side, I get 1 hundredth. So when I do that division, I essentially multiply by 100 on both sides. And I get 550 is equal to the amount that I put into account B, which leaves me with only $950 left to put into account A. And I could plug it back in and check to solve, but uh, this one is pretty easy to plug in and solve for, so uh, we'll go with trust in the numbers there. All right, when we talk about wind speeds and traveling by air, one thing that we need to know is that when we go west to east, we actually get our speed increased by the wind speed where it kind of like picks up the plane and takes it along with the wind. When we're going east to west, it's the opposite, however, though, because we're having to work against the wind. So our airspeed is actually, uh, so if our airspeed, let's say, was like 90 miles an hour, but our wind speed was 30 miles an hour, our ground speed that we would actually be traveling would only be 60 miles an hour. So there's a speed that you have to travel to actually just stay in place and not go anywhere. So check out this problem dealing with uh, wind or current problems. So the first thing we need to know here is that just like wind speeds, our speed going upstream will be however fast I'm rowing minus however fast the water is pushing me back. Then my speed downstream will be however fast I'm rowing plus the speed that the water is traveling. <clears throat> So then, if I set up both my equations, my upstream speed is 2, so that'll be equal to r minus w. My downstream speed is 5, so that'll be equal to r minus w. And if I add the two equations together, the w's cancel out, the r's combine for 2r, and the 2 and the 5 give me 7. So if I divide by 2 on both sides to get the r by itself, we find out that r, or my rowing speed that it would be in still water, is 3.5 miles per hour. 
go ahead and try B on your own. Pause the video and give it a shot. So this situation B is somewhat comedic when you think about it. If you're rowing in still waters only three miles per hour, and you're trying to row upstream against a stream whose current is four miles per hour. I drew a little picture over here. So you're going up at three, the current's pushing back at four. So the net that is going to happen is you floating downstream at one mile an hour, paddling your heart out trying to go upstream. So that would be probably pretty funny to watch. Uh, try number 27 or 28 if you want to give yourself a challenge. I'm not going to make us go through 27 and 28, so if you want to try those on your own, discuss those with me in class. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to say make sure you've worked through the entire modules online, and uh, make sure you let me know if you have any issues. Please do your homework, and have a wonderful day. Thank you.